Good day and welcome to Big Bad Tech. I'm your instructor, Jim Pytel, and today's topic of discussion is the introduction of fluid power systems. Our objective is to introduce fluid power systems and discuss the advantages, applications, and characteristics of such systems. Additionally, we'll reacquaint ourselves with the concept of energy, power, and efficiency as applied to fluid power systems. The purpose of a fluid power system is to perform work that cannot be accomplished by an unaided human or to perform a task more efficiently with respect to time. Consider the act of some bad guy making a hero dig his own grave. The movies make it seem like excavating a six-foot hole is an easy hour-long affair, and the only slightly dusty hero still has enough energy to do a backflip out of the grave, cut off the bad guy's head with a shovel, and sidekick his headless body into the grave. This is nonsense. Not only is the act of digging a hole a lot dirtier than movies suggest, anybody that digs a hole that big is going to be puking out of their eyes exhausted by the time they're done. Not to mention the bad guy is going to get so bored waiting for the hole to get dug, he's probably going to opt for the shallow grave option and shoot the dirty tired hero two hours into the day-long process. Consider, however, a bad guy equipped with an excavator, which can move as much dirt in one scoop as an unaided human can in one day. Problem solved. Bang. World conquest is laid at your doorstep, all thanks to fluid power. Who needs superhero powers when you can uproot trees, lift trucks, and punch holes through solid steel with fluid power? A fluid power system is one in which a fluid either a liquid or a gas, in contrast to electrical or mechanical means, is used to transmit power from one location to another. Fluid power systems come in two notable forms. Fluid power systems using liquid are called hydraulic systems, and fluid power systems using gas are called pneumatic systems. Hydraulic and pneumatic systems share some common properties. However, there are important differences between them. Both liquids and gases are states of matter differing from solids in that they take the shape of their container. Liquids, for the purposes of this lecture series, are to be considered incompressible. A certain mass of liquid occupies the same volume regardless of the available space or how much you squeeze it. Gases, however, are compressible, meaning they can contract and expand to fill containers of differing volumes. The same mass of gas can fit in a tiny capsule if compressed, as well as a large balloon if allowed to expand. Hydraulic systems most often use petroleum-based oil, whereas pneumatic systems use compressed air from the environment. This is to suggest that oil costs money, and air, for the time being, is plentiful and inexpensive. Oil, however, is a self-lubricating means of transmission and serves to minimize the friction between moving surfaces in addition to other functions. Air, in contrast, must be conditioned to do so. Both fluid mediums, in addition to transferring power, serve to lubricate and seal clearances between dynamically moving surfaces and transfer heat due to inefficiencies. Note that excessive heat can progressively damage and change the chemical nature of oil such that the oil itself can be considered a contaminant to the system. The fluid in a fluid power system is an essential component. In later lectures, we'll discuss fluid properties and conditioning needs. Hydraulic systems are ordinarily characterized as being capable of performing medium to heavy duty applications, whereas pneumatic systems are for light to medium duty applications. Liquid, because of its inherent incompressible nature, means actuators like cylinders, extend smoothly and continuously, and when in position, remain so. Gas, because of its inherent compressible nature, means actuators extend inconsistently in comparison, and when popped into position, are spongy and soft. This, in my personal opinion, is the principal advantage of hydraulic systems in comparison to all other systems, be they electrical, mechanical, or pneumatic. Hydraulic systems, in addition to being capable of lifting large loads, have incredible holding power. Liquid being incompressible in nature means that once pressurized flow enters a cylinder and lifts an applied load, any fluid trapped inside that cylinder may as well be replaced with a solid object if it is not allowed to leave the cylinder. 
Pneumatic systems must account for the compressible nature of gas. Mechanical systems must account for backlash between gears or play between mechanical linkages. Electrical systems don't really work well in static situations and often can only decelerate objects in the process of actually moving. Hydraulic systems, in contrast, are perfectly suited for such static applications. Want to lift a heavy load and keep it lifted? Let pressurized flow enter a cylinder and lift the load. Trap the liquid and forget about it. Since the trapped liquid is incompressible, that heavy load isn't going anywhere until you lower it, hopefully in a controlled fashion, by letting fluid slowly bleed out of the cylinder. We'll discuss flow control methods that allow the controlled descent of a lifted object in later lectures. Moving on, closed hydraulic systems circulate the oil through the system and a returning oil must be filtered, conditioned, and contained in a reservoir. Pneumatic systems, in contrast, simply exhaust the returning air to the atmosphere because, hey, why not? Air for the time being is free and you can always get more. Finally, hydraulic systems have a deserved reputation of being dirty, dirty, greasy, oily, nasty systems. The pneumatics, in contrast, are considerably cleaner. A spill in a hydraulic system is an environmental contamination hazard, whereas a leak in a pneumatic system is it necessarily environmentally hazardous? As if this wasn't enough, there are flammability concerns with hydraulic oil, especially around electricity and high temperatures. On a very basic level, fluid power systems are power conversion systems, where one form of input is changed to fluid power to eventually perform some task. Fluid power is characterized and controlled by pressure, flow rate, and valve position, among other properties. Ordinarily, the initial conversion to fluid power takes place in a pump, where typically rotational mechanical power, characterized by a twisting force called torque and rotational speed, is converted to fluid power. Pumps, therefore, are mechanical to fluid power converters. Ordinarily, pumps are driven by prime movers, like an electric motor or an internal combustion engine, themselves also being power converters. A motor would convert electrical power to rotational mechanical power, and an internal combustion engine would convert the stored chemical energy of old dinosaur bones to mechanical power, heat, and noise, noise, noise. Schematically, pumps are ordinarily represented as circles with an arrow pointing in the direction of provided pressurized flow. If the arrow is filled in, it means it's a hydraulic pump. If the arrow isn't filled in, it means it's a pneumatic air compressor. Think about it. Hydraulic systems are filled with dirty oil. The oil is black. Pneumatic systems are filled with clean air. The arrow is clear. The pump, in the case of a hydraulic system, ordinarily pumps stored oil from a tank known as a reservoir, symbolized by kind of a bathtub looking thing. If the reservoir is vented to the atmosphere, the bathtub wouldn't have a top. If the reservoir is sealed off from the atmosphere and pressurized, the bathtub would have a top. Sometimes the fluid power schematic may include the motor and shaft linked to the pump. Electric motors are often illustrated as an M in a circle. Internal combustion engines are often illustrated as a box inside a box. Both motors and internal combustion engines can be considered prime movers. The pump isn't ordinarily directly driven by the prime mover but rather the two shafts are linked via a coupling. The coupling compensates for misalignment and allows a technician to take the pair apart for maintenance and repair purposes. When the prime mover turns the shaft of the pump, the pump produces flow measured in units of volume per time, ordinarily gallons per minute or liters per minute. The load-induced opposition to flow is what creates pressure. If the pump is just pumping into empty space, there's no pressure, and to top it off, a rapidly expanding pool of oil on the floor. While we're still kind of on the subject of pumps, let me inform you that to fully, truly, and holistically comprehend the conversion of mechanical power to fluid power necessitates an understanding of what is producing the torque and rotational speed in the first place. This is to suggest that a complete and comprehensive understanding of fluid power systems 
doesn't begin at the pump, but rather at the motor driving the pump. Keeping in this spirit, a complete and comprehensive understanding of motors doesn't begin at the motor, but rather at the distribution, control systems, and electrical theory behind the motor, and on and on and on into infinite chains of causality. In the interest of forward progress, however, I've got to draw a line somewhere. So I'm arbitrarily drawing a line right here. For the purposes of this lecture series, you are hereby authorized to consider everything to the left of this line, be it mechanical, electrical, or magical, as exactly that. PFM. Pure magic. Later lectures will revisit these crucial points of interaction in greater detail. Expect me at some point in the future to level with you and admit all our previous assumptions are in fact cartoonish simplifications. I can't blame you for being mad at me for withholding information, but realize I am withholding a lot of information for you for two important reasons. One, it's not important now. And two, I operate under the Kung Fu principle and that I am always entitled to withhold one trick from you lest you come back at a later date and challenge me. I, quite like your mama, continually reserve the right to set you on my knee and spank you regardless of your age or profession. Moving on, as previously mentioned, fluid power is characterized by several properties, notably pressure, flow rate, and valve position. A fluid power system is only effective if these properties are controlled and measured. As we'll later learn, there exists a degree of crosstalk between these properties, but for now, we can make this bold and memorable simplification. Pressure is strength, flow rate is speed, and valve position is direction. If you can walk away from this entire lecture series with just this simple understanding, I will consider my time having not been spent in vain. The principle that largely governs fluid power systems is known as Pascal's Law, which in summation states that when force is applied to a confined fluid in a closed system, it exerts pressure equally in all directions. A large number of introductory fluid power principles can be demonstrated using a pair of syringes linked by a hose. When two empty syringes are capped off, there is a quantity of air entrapped between the two pistons. This entrapped air is now a confined fluid and this is a basic pneumatic system. As I push in one of the syringes, the entrapped air pushes on the face of the other piston and the other syringe extends. Air is being employed as a means of power transmission in contrast to mechanical or electrical means. The pistons needn't be in line with one another and could be angularly offset from each other as an example. As long as they're linked by a passageway, gas can be used to transfer power in this simple pneumatic system. Note the inconsistency with which the pneumatic actuators extend. There's a bit of lag in actuation. Additionally, note the sponginess of an actuator supporting a load. These observed characteristics are due to the compressible nature of air and something that must be accounted for in a pneumatic system. In contrast, when the two syringes are filled with water and capped off, the entrapped water is now a confined fluid and this is a basic hydraulic system. As previously, I can push in one syringe and the piston face pushes on the entrapped water and the entrapped water pushes on the face of the other piston and the other syringe extends. Liquid is being employed as a means of power transmission in contrast to gas, mechanical, or electrical means. As previously, the pistons needn't be in line with one another and could be angularly offset from one another. As long as the two cylinders remain linked by a passageway, liquid can be used to transfer power in this simple hydraulic system. In contrast to our previously examined simple pneumatic system, note the consistency, predictability, and regularity with which the hydraulically driven actuators extend. There's no lag in actuation. Additionally, note the firmness of a hydraulic actuator supporting a load. These observed characteristics are due to the incompressible nature of liquid and present a major advantage over pneumatic systems. In the interest of fairness, when a pneumatic system springs a leak, it's far easier to clean up than a leak in a hydraulic system. 